September 1, 2022, uh, executive session. We have a couple matters on the agenda. The first is approval of minutes from Thursday, August 11. Entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Brian, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Having no discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Next is approval of secretary's fees. Entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Yeah. Brian, is there a second? Is there any discussion? All right. Hearing no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? None. None. Motion carries. Uh, we'll be reconvening our working session, executive session, after the completion of the public hearing. Uh, and uh, at that time, we'll be voting on any of the matters that actually do go forward today. At this time, I'm going to move right into the uh, call for our public hearing, September 1, 2022. When a matter is first called, uh, I'll be making the call, which basically is what's on our agenda, which you might have as copies over there. Uh, at, uh, while I'm making the call, please don't begin your presentation. Uh, you can walk up to the podium, get ready, do whatever you want, but don't start uh, your presentation until I'm done talking. Also, don't try to hand us anything again while I'm talking to make the call. We're trying to create a record. Uh, once I'll introduce, I'll say, go ahead or whatever, introduce yourself, and you can start at that time. If you want us to consider anything during uh, the hearing, please, uh, at any time during your hearing, pass out anything you want us to consider, photographs, uh, petitions, whatever you have. We, we do have available online uh, the application that you submitted, so we do have that information. But if you want for ease to show it uh, for plans, you can do that as well. After the applicant's presentation, I will then invite anyone who's interested in the matter to speak. I first invite those who are that are in favor of the application to speak. Uh, yeah, and then I will invite anyone who opposes that application to speak. Uh, if there is any opposition, I then allow the applicant or his or her agent to address those comments in opposition to the application. That is a rebuttal time period uh, for the applicant. It's not a time to restate your application. It's a time to address the comments in opposition. The meeting's being taped, and that's required by law. And why I gave the instructions uh, in the beginning about not talking over me as the chairman or not talking over anyone else, it's very important that we be able to understand the tape. Only one person can speak at a time. Anyone who does want to speak, you need to go up to the podium and give your name and address. Uh, we welcome the comments. Also, if there's people that are commenting uh, from remote, that's fine. I make sure I give enough time to allow you to chime in, raising your hand or speaking up on yourself uh, at that time when you need to speak. Uh, I invite anyone who's interested in application uh, to uh, address this board and discuss your thoughts about a particular application, whether you're in favor or against it. However, if your comments are too far off the point, I reserve my right as chairman to restrict your comments at any time. Uh, anyone who's interested in the application, whether you're the one that's presented it, you're the property owner, or you have some interest in it, whether you're in favor or against it, you can remain after the public hearing. Uh, we have a fairly short docket. Uh, hopefully it goes short by the number, but uh, assuming it does go pretty quickly, we'll go right into our working session and we'll be voting on each application that goes forward. There are five voting members for the Zoning Board of Appeals. In order for your application to be granted, you need a supermajority. That means you need four of the five to vote in favor. If it's just a regular simple majority, three to two in favor, or something different than that, uh, less than that, the application's been denied. If you cannot stay and listen to the comments, I advise anyone who's interested to stay and listen, because sometimes there's some helpful discussion about why we're doing uh, or why we are going to do what we did. Uh, so, you know, I think it's important for the applicant or anyone interested uh, to stay. If you can't stay, call the office uh, tomorrow and you can find out what happened. If the application for a waiver is granted, it's not going to be valid until it's recorded on our land records. Uh, in order to have that occur, the applicant must send or bring a check in the amount of $60 made out to the town of Fairfield and either bring it or send it to the zoning office Wednesday or later uh, after the meeting for proper recording of the notice. Any waiver involving construction, whether it's a new dwelling addition or an alteration, will require an as-built before there can be any Good. issuance of a certificate of zoning compliance 
uh, and a certificate of occupancy. Uh, our first item that we have is from our continued docket, and that is 277 uh, Tamor Drive, Map 73, Parcel 145, Petition of Basil Zaharis for a variance of zoning regulation, Section 5.2.4, to reduce the sideline setback from 15 feet, currently 24.5 feet, proposing 9.8 feet, permission to construct a one-story, one-car uh, garage addition, premises R3 zone. Senator Rizzio. Sorry, this is quite an entry. <laughs> I guess you know I'm here. Uh, <laughs> chair and members of the commission, it's been a while. Uh, I think you've messed me up when you switched the table. Um, chair and members of the commission, my name is Ray Rizzio. Happy to be before you representing Basil Harris with regard to this property at 277 Tamar Drive. We are here for a basically a side yard setback to bring it down to 9.8 feet. This is continued because we re, what we did is we, we, we thought we could get a better plan. Originally, this is the way it was filed, but the, to keep it 10 foot, what happens with our regs, if the garage, one single story garage is attached, it has, a, it has a certain setback, the house setback. If it's detached, it's only 10 feet. So we had attached it and left it at 10 feet because we really didn't have much room. One of the things, architecturally, street look wise, everything else, it didn't really look right sticking out beyond the home. So we continued last meeting. We have now pushed the pushed the garage back equal to the, the front the front elevation of the home. And what happens is because of the diagonal um, shape of the lot, it reduced us to 9.8 feet. Um, we, the house has no garage. The house, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of pictures. The, the neighbor next door is, both has two car garage next to it. If this were detached, we'd be off. In other words, if we put a foot or even six inches between the house and this, we would be on basically compliant if we pushed it forward. We'd like to keep the, house, the garage attached to the home. I'm just going to take you through a quick tour. We'll make this quick. I need my pictures. Um, so this is the house. If you look at the build, if you look at the house from the front, it's the, the garage is going to go to the left. This is the area. The next picture shows the area where the garage will go. As I said, it abuts to garages. There's already a fence between the properties and abuts the garages to, to the left of it. The issue is why, why, why couldn't you put it on the other side? This is basically a, a, a raised ranch, and this is the side that there is room. But however, what happens is we have bedrooms and dens, and if you put the garage against this, you lose your accessible windows. So we believe the proper spot for it would be where you get an entrance directly into the home. It works much better. These are basically showing that the, the, these windows would be halfway in the garage and basically destroy that side of the house's living area. Um, as you can see, there's a mudroom right there next to where the garage would be going. It's already there anyway. And rather than park the cars on the grass, we believe parking it in a single car garage would be better. As you can see, what's unique about this lot, it's very narrow. It's long and deep. We don't have any issues with regard to coverage, lot area, anything. It's just because of the narrowness of the lot and the shape of the lot, we're here before you requesting this variance. Um, this is the lot next door. As you can see, their garage there, no windows. So there's no ne ne negative impact on anybody's privacy in the and they also have a, another trailer there. That's a better picture of the house next door. And as you can see, most of these houses all have at least a single car garage. I believe this is maybe one, maybe the only house on Tamar Drive that does not have a garage. We have gone to each and every one of our neighbors that are impacted, and they've all sent us hand in the original. They've all signed a petition supporting this application. Our hardship is we is number one, it's a uh, the, sh the shape of the lot, which is long and narrow, um, the conditions that currently exist with regard to the existing home, the fact that it doesn't have a garage, and that it'll have no negative impact. It's, we believe it's consistent with the master plan, but will have no negative impact on the health, safety, uh, or, or value of any re other re surrounding residential properties. I'm happy to continue to expound on it, but I think, as you can see, it, it, the narrowness of the lot is our hardship. The the angle of the lot, and then the ability when you when you apply the fact that if you detach this by six inches, 
we should probably make the 10 feet work. But we're at 9.8 feet with the with the with the, with the um, garage attached. What we would if we moved it up forward to the front setback, and then it's actually the garage out in front of the house and detached it from the home. You wouldn't need a variance, but you would also have something that's totally out of character for the neighborhood, and we don't think makes much makes much sense. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Board, have any questions for Attorney Rizzio? All right. Are there are no questions. Is there anyone that wishes to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone in opposition to the application? All right. Thank you, Terry. Don't be bad. So, <laughs> you'll sit in the front row. Be yeah. safer that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the general docket, number one, 165 Lowndes uh, Ferry Road, map 49, parcel 112, petition of John Olson for a variance of the zoning regulation, section 5.2.4.3, to reduce the street line setback for an accessory structure for 40 feet, proposing 3.2 uh, feet, permission to construct a 12 by 18, one story shed, premises R3. Mr. Olson, go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, my name is John Olson, 165 Lonsbury Road, uh, Fairfield, Connecticut. Uh, I am uh, requesting to uh, put a pre-built uh, shed on my property there. I have a, a corner lot uh, sloping, so my, pretty much my entire yard is a 30-foot setback. Um, I apologize for not, I thought I sent some pictures in, but I probably didn't do it in time. Um, the shed itself would be almost 10 feet off the curb behind a, uh, a fence that's already existing there. Uh, it's also the uh, probably the most convenient location, and it's my yard slopes, and this is kind of like the, the, the flattest part of the yard, uh, somewhat adjacent to the, uh, um, to the property. Um, the, my Lonsbury Road is a, just a short jog. Uh, the part I live on, so my backyard is, no, no. If, if you look at my house, it's the side yard, but it's the back of the Presbyterian Church, uh, and I have, uh, so it's a, a dead end, I have checked with all my neighbors, I've had them sign the documents that were requested, uh, and I'm just looking for permission to, to, to do that. Uh, I do have a picture on my phone, which is a little more thing, I don't know if you want to pass it down. You had sent pictures yeah. by uh, email. We got yes. Oh, you got them, okay, yeah. yes, yeah, there's a truck there, I, I kind of use that as a reference point. Behind the, uh, yeah. Behind the truck, uh, parallel to the fence yes. is yes. Uh, where I'd like That's to do it. other part of your record. So yeah, okay, I didn't know. Uh, they were forward, uh, I was a little late, so I wasn't sure. So uh, uh, again, this morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, like I said, it, it's it's uh, not really obtrusive to the neighborhood. It's a very nice, expensive shed um, that matches the house uh, and, and pretty much the decor of the neighborhood. Um, I guess that's about all I have to say. If anybody has any questions, right. thank you. <clears throat> the board have any questions for Mr. Olson? Um. That and, yeah, from that angle. But what happens is, if you see if, if the one with the big tree, it, that starts up the hill. And I, my house is actually like an undercar garage. The rest of the thing just slopes up uh, uh, towards the house. Uh, I didn't do a very good picture on my slope. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Yeah, and, and the other reason is there's a very large tree on that backside. It does kind of slope around and we're good. Somebody, we're going to have to take that tree down. My neighbor and I are going to have to discuss that because it's getting a little. I don't want to put it right underneath something I'm going to have to uh, remove. <coughs> Anyone, any other questions for Mr. Olson? Okay. There are any other questions? Anyone wish to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone in opposition? Thank you, Mr. Olson. Next item that we have is number two. 43 Warwick Avenue, uh, Map 30, Parcel 39, Petition of Michael and Ann uh, Malvicini uh, for variance of zoning regulation section 5.2.4 to reduce the sideline setback to 7 feet, currently 4.8 feet, proposing 4.8 feet, 
permission to construct a second floor addition premises A zone. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Right there. Okay. Mike Malvasini, 43 Warwick Avenue. You pretty much said everything that I would, would, would be saying. That's what we want to do. We want to add on, go straight up with a straight footprint. We're only five feet away to this, and the setback is normally seven. Um, what I could say is, so you have all the information. You Would you like me to give you my abutting neighbors sign off now? Or? Uh, sure, yeah, and one of the neighbors sent an email uh, to the town as well. Uh, would that be Ben? Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, he said he might. That's that correct. It. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what I, yeah, I was going to ask you, the only thing I can say about everything is that uh, I don't know if you've gotten any feedback from the letters at all negatively, but I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from people walking, you know, that I know by sight saying good luck, and many people seem to be in favor, but that's only verbal. So. Well, I would let you know if we receive the letter to give you an opportunity to comment. We haven't see, received anything in opposition, and uh, sometimes people show up, though. Well, no, I'm just going to say, that was the only thing I wanted to say about the whole thing. I've gotten a lot of positive verbal feedback from everybody who got the letter saying good luck and all, and... And one thing, the reason why we actually want to do that is because the neighborhood's so good, we want to stay there and improve on the house. So, so I would say that um, you have all the information, so if you'd like me to answer any questions, I'll be happy to. And Thank you, sir. Before I don't need to further state anything. You you know what we're trying to do. All right. Does the board have any questions for Mr. Malcolm? Hearing no questions, is there anyone who wish to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone in opposition? All right. Thank you, sir. We're going to close the hearing. Thank you. Next item that we have is number 3, 60 Puritan Road, Map 139, Parcel 142, Petition of uh, Kerry A. O'Connor, uh, Revocable Trust for Variance of the zoning regulation, section 5.2.5, to increase the total lock coverage from 20% from 23.4%, proposing 26.5%. Permission to construct a covered open patio premises. A zone. Attorney Fallon, go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, ladies and gentlemen. For the record, my name is John Fallon. I'm pleased to be here representing Kerry O'Connor, who is seated in the front row right there. And, um, we thank you for hearing us today. As the call indicates, the property is located at 60 Puritan Road. We're seeking a variance of Section 5.2.5 to increase the current lot coverage from 23.4% to 26.5% in order to construct uh, and accommodate the construction of a covered open patio area adjacent to a proposed in-ground swimming pool at Cary's property, which I'll discuss in a minute. The property is located in the Residence A Zoning District. Uh, when you examine the records, as I've done with Mr. Decker, uh, the existing lot coverage in 2011 was shown to be 22.5%. There was a certificate of occupancy that was issued to a prior owner uh, to establish that lot coverage. In December of 2011, other prior owners uh, made an application for a variance to increase the lot coverage from 22.5% to 22.8% in order to construct a one-story uh, and second-floor dormer addition, which they did. After Kerry bought the property and in conjunction with this application, uh, a survey was prepared. That's the survey you have, and it showed the existing coverage to be 23.4%. When I reviewed that with Mr. Decker, uh, it was determined that the prior owners uh, had, in fact, at some point in time, constructed a small shed as shown on the survey uh, submitted and uh, that, that along the north of property line, and that's what led to the increase uh, to 23.4%. So that's how the, the current coverage came to be. Of course, we're seeking a variance, as I've discussed, uh, to take it to 26.5%. Now, what's the reasons for that? Uh, Carrie has four young, beautiful children, uh, as you might Imagine looking at their mother, they're extremely fair-skinned and uh, for whom uh, it's been recommended that the protection from the sun be strongly advised. In addition, Carrie's parents, 
who uh, live in Fairfield and visit the home regularly and would like to enjoy their grandchildren, their daughter in the new pool. Uh, they both had significant issues with skin cancer. Unfortunately, Carrie's mother has suffered from both melanoma and lymphoma and has been medically avoided to try to limit and avoid uh, direct sunlight. Similarly, her dad uh, has had numerous precancerous lesions removed from his face and has also been avoid to, uh, asked to avoid direct sunlight. We looked at other options here, one of which, of course, would be umbrellas. Uh, number one, we didn't think that was attractive, as attractive aesthetically as what has been designed here, but more importantly, they just wouldn't be a workable option uh, due to the angle of the sun during most times of the day in the backyard where the pool is located. The covered area uh, over the patio is proposed on the plans will have no walls and, and will be open on all sides. It almost has like a, a nice trellis effect. It was designed by uh, William Levy Architects here in Fairfield. I think it's extremely attractive uh, and it's important to know that what it's simply designed to do is to protect uh, Carrie's family, her children, and her parents uh, from prolonged direct uh, long-term harm due to exposure to the sun. Pursuant to section 31.2.22, the patio uh, is not included in coverage. And if we didn't need to put this cover over the patio for the reasons I've set forth, it would simply, as grade level, not impact the coverage at all. But because it is got the roof over it under the regs, it has to be included in coverage. As I said, uh, uncovered on all sides. It was professionally designed by Bill Levy. Uh, Carrie's reviewed the application and the design with all of her neighbors. You have a um, petition that I have submitted on her behalf, and uh, all the neighbors think it's attractive and is a nice enhancement to, to the property. Obviously, we're going to comply with all other provisions of the uh, regulations with regard to height, setbacks, and the like. This is simply a technical variance relative to the coverage because the patio doesn't cover, count in coverage, but the covered area does. So that's really the application in a nutshell. Um, we'd be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, obviously, the property has been subject to variances in the past relative to coverage. This is a small one, but it's solely to, uh, as I say, accommodate this covered area of the patio for the reasons I said before. Thank you, Attorney Fallon. Does the board have any questions for Attorney Fallon? Go ahead, Jane. Hi. Um, what's to prevent walls being built underneath this? It, 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 that, if, if there was an attempt that you could make that a condition of approval, most certainly, but also that couldn't be done without a building permit, and at that point in time, that, that issue would have to be addressed. Okay. And then you know what the hardship used mm -hmm. to be? Yes. Has to be tied to the property? Correct. Not the particular needs of the family? Correct. So what is the hardship that's tied to the I think in this, characteristics of this property? I think in this particular case, the location of the property, based upon the impact uh, during certainly summer hours such as this, has, has significant impact. And indeed, the property, the property, as I said, was subject to a variance granted by this board in 2012 for an addition, which I also think, you know, the same question could have been asked. I think in this particular case, the, the application simply seeks some protection for the family uh, for the reasons I said. And I think that, you know, a most technical reading of hardship could render your question uh, credible. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I think the board is bound with substantial discretion and, and can look to the, the situations in terms of the property itself and prior approvals uh, for purposes of planning. So you're saying the hardship is that it's I'm saying that the location of the property yes. as it relates to the angles of the sun at particular times of day is what is driving the application and that might be very well unique uh, to the property or certainly other aspects of the neighborhood. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, should the next owner determine to take this down, mm -hmm. does this variance leave with it, or would they then be able to build somewhere else? No, the variance. Asking. I'm sorry. The answer to that question is when this board approves a variance, it approves a variance based upon a set, a set of submitted plans. So the, to the extent that the variance runs with the land, that's true. 
but it only applies to the structure that you're approving. So that if someone came in and wanted to, to build an attached addition to the property, uh, not only would they still have to get a building permit for that, but I think the board uh, and, and staff, and I think Matt would confirm this, would take a position, well, no, you've got to come back now because what was approved here, the variance that was approved related directly to this um, area over the patio. Because when you do approve plans, um, when you do approve variances, you approve them based upon what is submitted to be done. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, is there anyone wish to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone in opposition to the application? All right. And to close the hearing, thank you. Turn thank you very much. Uh, next item is number 470 Sanford Street, uh, map 180, parcel 239, petition of Town of Fairfield for a variance of zoning regulation, section 28.6.4, to reduce the required parking space to zero, permission to allow seasonal outdoor on-site musical events, premises, CDD zone. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, for the record, my name is Bill Fitzpatrick. I'm an attorney in Fairfield with the law firm of Russo and Rizzio. Offices at 10 Sasco Hill Road. We're here this afternoon representing the Fairfield Theater Company, lessee of property at 70 Sanford Street from the town of Fairfield. The property is located at the northerly end of Sanford Street, just across the street from the tracks and this railroad station. The Fairfield Theater Company, Inc., or FTC, as it is better known, is a not for profit arts group which has been at 70 Sanford Street since 2003. Property at 70 Sanford Street is owned by the town of Fairfield, contains a former industrial building, which is L-shaped. The property contains 34,188 square feet located in the center design district. FTC has utilized part of the building on the property to create a small capacity theater known as Stage 1 on the premises. Stage 1 has an occupancy of 225 patrons. It has proven to be successful offering an intimate setting and presents live music, speakers, films, and community activities for the public. The applicant also utilizes a space known as the warehouse at the other end of the building, the northerly portion, which accommodates 640 patrons. Additional capacity has resulted in a great success for FTC. This space can accommodate performances that require more seating than the stage one venue can offer. To accomplish the utilization of the warehouse in its present configuration, the applicant obtained variances of section 28.6.4, the zoning regulations, to reduce the required theater seating parking to the existing 21 spaces. These variances were approved by the ZBA in October of 2014 and November of 2019. At this point, the FTC is requesting a variance to permit the continued seasonal outdoor use of its parking area on site for outdoor concert events. These events have been held in the parking lot for several years, uh, primarily late on Friday afternoons. The FTC practice has been to charge no admission for these events. However, there has been a request by a musical group to hold its paying performance outside in the parking lot rather than in the warehouse due to safety concerns, specifically COVID concerns. As a result of the conducting of a performance for which admission will be charged, despite the fact it's in the parking lot, the zoning department has requested the FTC obtain a variance of the required parking. That's why we're here. The applicant is specifically requesting a variance of section 28.6.4 of the regulations to reduce the required parking reduced by prior variances of 21 spaces to zero spaces in conjunction with seasonal outdoor musical events in the on-site parking area. Let me reemphasize, this variance request applies only to outdoor musical events in the parking lot. This parking will continue to be available as in the past for stage one and warehouse events. The Commission is well aware the test for the granting of a variance is set forth in the case of Archambault v. Wadlow, 25 Connecticut Appellate 375, a 1991 case which states, regarding hardship under general statutes, section 8-6, parents 3 and parents, the local zoning board may grant a variance where two basic conditions are met, 
One, their variance is shown not to affect substantially the comprehensive zoning plan, and two, adherence to the strict letter of the zoning regulations is shown to cause unusual hardship unnecessary to the carrying out of the general purpose of the zoning plan, end quote. First part of the test, that the proposal has no substantial effect on the comprehensive plan is met here since the proposed use of theater is a permitted use in the center design district. Second part of the test, adherence to the strict letter of the regulations is shown to cause unusual hardship unnecessary to the carrying out of the general purpose of the zoning plan is met here, I would submit, by several factors. The most important factor the board should take into account is the fact that there is significant off-street parking available at the time of the, these FTC outdoor performances. As you know, the FTC property is immediately south of the Fairfield Railroad Station. South of the railroad tracks, on the same side as FTC, the parking authority offers 123 parking spaces for public use after 5 p.m. North of the train tracks, 894 parking spaces are leased by the parking authority and offer the same public use after 5 p.m. The fact is there are over 1,000 commuter spaces available within walking distance of FTC that are made available to the public by the parking authority after 5 p.m. All of the proposed events are after 5 p.m. Keep in mind the parking lot as 21 spaces, we're talking about 1,000 spaces being available. Clearly, there's more than adequate available off-site parking within walking distance, which is readily available. As such, the purpose and intent of the parking regulation, I submit, is being satisfied. I should also note the FTC wishes to erect a small stage in the corner of the existing parking lot. The construction of this stage will not result in any change in the availability of parking on site. The applicant has not scheduled use of the indoor venues at the same time as the outdoor events. The indoor venues are used only for bathrooms and bar service and in the event of inclement weather. Uh, approval of this application permits the continued use of the parking lot on site for seasonal outdoor concert events. It's important to note on knowledge and belief there have been no complaints to the town resulting from or pertaining to any of the outdoor events which have taken place in the past. The town of Fairfield is supportive of this, is supportive of this request. Mr. Mark Barnhart, the town <coughs> director of economic development, has submitted a letter in support of this application. Um, the board's approval will permit FTC to continue to flourish as a community resource. FTC brings people downtown which only benefits downtown restaurants and retailers. Um, I encourage the board to vote in favor of this proposal. Mr. John Reed, the producing artistic director of FTC is here with me, and John and I would be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Chris Patrick. Uh, board have any questions? Is it white denim? White denim. White denim. Um, does this, is this, this is not specifically for one event. That's correct, it's, but it relates to paying outdoor events of which there has only been one which is taking place soon. So is this variance tied only to after 5 p.m. events? Perfectly willing to accept that as a condition. Would it also be an acceptable or considered condition that these events not be scheduled in conjunction with indoor outdoor events like multi stage events or fests, et cetera? Please come on. I mean, we would prefer the flexibility to, if it makes sense, to do an indoor event as a practical matter. The sound transfers from outside to inside would make it very difficult. An example would be a quiet acoustic act outside and a louder act inside. So, the, so the inside act, there's no what I'd say noise pollution. Mm -hmm. Thus far, of the of the shows we've done, uh, probably in the last two years, 17 shows we have not opened any. Of them. We haven't used the other guys. Mm -hmm. I 
Any other questions? Okay. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the application? I'll be in favor. <laughs> I'm a member, and I think it's an asset to the community. So. Did you say your name again, sir? Mike Malvasini. Okay. Uh, any other uh, people in favor of the application? Is there anyone in opposition to the application? All right. Close the hearing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Our next item that we have is 1143 Sasco Hill Road, Lot 3, Map 239, Parcel 7, Petition of 1143 Sasco Hill Road, LLC, for a variance of zoning regulations, Section 5.1.1 and Section 2.7 to reduce the lot frontage from 200 feet, proposing 82.21 feet, uh, permission to reduce the lot frontage, premises AAA zone. And I think it makes sense, Attorney Rizzio, to call these together, you're going to have an overlapping hearing, yes. is that accurate? Yes, because they're both related to the yes. same issue. Yes. And number six is 1143 Sasco Hill Road, Lot 1, Map 239, Parcel 7, Petition of 1143 Sasco Hill Road, LLC, for a variance of zoning regulation, Section 5.1.1, to reduce the lot size from 87,120 square feet, proposing 81,764 square feet, permission to reduce the lot area, premises AAA zone. Go ahead, sir. Chair, members of the commission, my name is Ray Rizzio. Happy to be before you representing 1143 Sasco Hill Road, LLC. Um, if you can remember, this is the large track at the end of Sasco Hill Road that was subdivided into seven lots. I'm showing you <coughs> what was the, the lots that were approved, and I'm going to show you why we're, what we're suggesting the changes. When the lots were originally, when the, when the subdivision was originally approved, it was the intent of the developer, he thought, to take down everything. He got, as he got into the house, realized all the architectural features, the historical character of everything, he decided he was going to do a major renovation and keep the house. So the house is now being restored to its, I mean, it's a massive home. It's a beautiful home. I walked through it. He has restored the entire home. However, the problem with restoring the home and now keeping the home as related to a subdivision where, where you intended on repositioning a home if you if the, the view from this home on a what was intended at the original subdivision would be to look out toward the water. There's a lot here in, in front of it. So the original subdivision has, I'm sorry. Yeah, the original subdivision shows that the this lot, let me turn this around. Here's the original subdivision. The original subdivision has had this frontage taking over the entire cul-de-sac. So that's how they got their frontage rather than being a rear lot. That was not going to be an issue because the proposed home would have would have looked out between these two lots to Long Island Sound if they had taken if they were to take down the home. He has decided and I'll show you you will see pictures, he has decided to retain the home, restore it to its character. And that leads to the two, believe it or not, the the two variances on two separate lots, which is to preserve, this home was built in 1928. It's spectacular from both the water, now from the street. Um, it has a tremendous presence in it. It represents the old Sasco Hill mansions that were built up on that hill. So what the idea would be, the problem is now, keeping the home here, this lot, which is large and excessive, I mean, it's probably, it's over three acres, controls this side of the cul-de-sac. It was never going to be an issue because it was kind of going to be a side setback. But now what you have is this being the front, basically still the, the rear view or I almost consider it the front setback because it's going to, it's going to review, the water, review the water. So what we would like to do is move the property line from this side of the cul-de-sac to about halfway through the cul-de-sac so that this property, in the way it's constructed and has been constructed for almost 100 years, 90 years, will maintain and still be oriented in its current capacity and not be rendered or lose control of any of its view in, uh, in view of the south. Does that make sense? So what you have is a house that was not going to be here. The only way to, the, the proper way in positioning in, in the land would have been to build it facing, let's call it, east, 
facing uh, west, basically, and not facing north. So now this home's going to remain, be restored. Make sense? Yeah, it's yeah. south. <laughs> well, this is our this is our this is going south. No, uh, no, the arrow is not. No, he's got a zero backwards. He's got a zero backwards, and, and I'm reading it upside down, so I apologize. But at least I didn't trip. Um, so we're trying to keep the southern the southern exposure. We're trying to maintain it open and have the owner of this home be able to control the land in front of it. Both lots have no issue with regard to size. The cul-de-sac does not change. If you look at the pictures which I show you, there is more than that. It, it really would almost, it, none, of the, none of this would be buildable. It's all within a setback. So it's not going to change the character of any lot. And the, pra the practicality of it, the view, the, um, the appearance of anybody from the cul-de-sac as to who owns that portion of the lot. This is basically a view, but how far the view is from the cul-de-sac. Um, as you can see, this is down looking out toward the house. The house is spectacular. Um, there, that, that um, fire hydrant is about right, right there. And as you can see, there's more than significant area to um, just, and there it is again, to get your view of the house. So that's how big the yard is. It's really about everything on this side of the cul-de-sac going with this home. There is no, as I said, more than both are both very large lots. There is no issue with regard to lot area. We don't get any additional units. It's merely placing the lot line in an area that makes sense on what is a private road anyway. So it's not even a town road. It's not maintained by the town. It's not found by the town. So we believe that it was worth keeping this house. The physical characteristics of the lot are the reason uh, and, and, and the home that was on it is the reason for the barracks. And that's for lot three. That's for lot three. Okay. Okay. Similarly, with regard to the front lot, in keeping the house, the, once the decision made to keep the house, the whole... Get my back to my pictures. Sorry. <coughs> so... They had this beautiful cobblestone courtyard. Originally, that was going to go. That is now staying. The problem is the lot was designed back to here. Coming here, this cobblestone courtyard was going to go away, so it wasn't an issue. The driveway all connects in here. Basically, just touches the back of the cobblestone courtyard. What we want to do is just straighten out the lot line which brings this lot down to 1.88 acres and makes this lot a little larger at 2.52 acres. We, this will give the ability to keep the cobblestone courtyard as we now straighten out the line, keep the cobblestone in your courtyard, allow for a planting buffer, allow for the, for the driveway not to basically, in this beautiful courtyard, sit on top of the lot. As I said, in the original plan, that was all to go. In making this argument, it's the amount of these historical features that we want wishing to preserve that are driving this easement. There is no additional lot being granted. There is, these will, this was going to be seven, six houses in a lot. It was originally going to be just seven lots. It's now six houses in a lot. We get no real benefit except to get this, this magnificent home and all of its physical characteristics characteristics to be able to remain intact. Um, as you can see, the pictures of the house in the courtyard, cart the courtyard, the home is just beautiful. By keeping that courtyard intact, it was really meant for, it was, it was, that's go, the courtyard goes back to 1928. And, um, and then this is the private road that goes in. Um, we have talked to all of our neighbors I'll also give you a little map to show you that having a lot, I'll show you the lots that surround us, a GIS map. So the neighbor, most, the only real neighbor affected is Mr. Samuelson, who has the lot adjoining this property, the entire length. And he has, 
I've authorized me to tell you he has no opposition to this matter. He's been completely supportive of preserving the home and having the property, house properly subdivided. When you look to other alternate, if you look at the three other lots that basically are around our lot, there are three lots within probably 100 feet that are 74,000, 62,000, and 52,000 feet. This lot will be, as I said, 1.8 acres. To the eye, you'll never be able to tell whether it's two acres or 1.8 acres. There's nothing gained except the preservation of all the important characteristics of this historic home. I don't believe, as I said, the hardship is you've got a structure there that's been there for almost 100 years. We are doing what we can to preserve it. It's, I think, one of the most well-known houses along Long Island Sound and certainly in town. And this will allow us to preserve its true architectural character and nature without having any detrimental effect on any neighboring properties, creating any additional traffic, and having any effect on the health, safety, and residence of the town of Fairfield. I think pursuant to your plan of conservation and development, there is a desire to preserve these historic structures and, in this instance, certainly keep with the grandness of the property that has been there historically. I'd be happy to answer any questions that I... It's kind of a... Once this house got preserved, kind of things had to slide. Keep in mind, it's all private road. It's not on a public road. It's all privately maintained. It's going to be gated so that it's not even something that anybody will... Actually, unless you're living there, you're not going to even really come across this issue at all. So, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Attorney Rizzio. Does the board have any questions? Thank you. Go ahead. Is that the original house on the National Register? I don't... They could... He had the ability... I'm not going to say it's true. I know he had the ability to tear it. That was all research. He had the ability to tear it down. I can't tell you. I don't think so. I don't know. I know the property. Yes. And then on the original subdivision drawing, does it indicate that that house is going to be torn down? It didn't need to be. The only thing we came back at one point was where they did want to preserve the garage. Yes. So, you guys gave us a variance to allow that garage to stay there. But there was nothing keeping that house? No. The house had no... The house... And you can see, if you were... If you weren't worried about preserving it, the proper way to situate it would be facing southeast, regardless of what the arrow says. What are they going to do with the boathouse? The boathouse is going to stay with the lot down below. And they're restoring that, too. I walked through the house. It is spectacular. I certainly think they'd welcome inspection by the Zoning Board of Appeals if they want to take a look post-hearing to take a look at the piece. But it's a spectacular piece of property. The client really wants this thing developed correctly and is taking his time. Any other questions from the board? Any other questions? Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the application? Is there anyone in opposition? Thank you, Senator. We'll close the hearing on 5 and 6. The next items we have are 7 and 8, which overlap a bit. So, if you would do exactly what Attorney Rizzo, I'll make the call, but obviously you know what to do in separating your argument as to the reversal. One hearing, I think, though, is absolutely fine. Yes. So, number 7, 1125 Pequot Avenue, Map 281, Parcel 15, Petition of Spread of Eagle Trading, LLC, to reverse a decision of Zoning Administrator, Premises R3 Zone. And then we have number 8, same property, 1125 Pequot Avenue, Map 281, Parcel 15, Petition of Spread of Eagle Trading, LLC, for a variance of Zoning Regulation, Section 32.7, to allow a horizontal structural member to be less than 1.1 feet above the base flood elevation, proposing an elevation of 3.22 feet below the base flood elevation, permission to construct a patio expansion, Premises 
R3 zone. Attorney Fallon, go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, my name is John Fallon. I'm representing the property owner. With me here today is Mr. Peter Romano of Lantec and our structural engineer, <clears throat> Nick Cuoco, who's right there, of Cuoco Structural Engineers, um, a licensed professional engineer here in Connecticut. <clears throat> so we have two applications, one record combined hearing. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about the application for reversal of the zoning officer's uh, decision. The facts, however, I'll go through only once because the facts are relevant and germane to both applications. My client purchased the property in October of 2011. Shortly thereafter, the presently existing home and swimming pool that are at the property now were built. At the time, there were plans to construct a boathouse and cabana at the pool, as well as expand the existing patio. Prior to these accessory items uh, being constructed, the FEMA flood zone mapping was revised in 2013, and the property was mapped for the first time in its history in the high velocity flood zone, VE14. Uh, there was no explanation, prior warning, or rationalization given by FEMA for that, and indeed I think it took the town and the, and, and the property owner by surprise, and it was fairly focused for some reason on this piece of property. Commencing in 2020, uh, representatives of the owner, including Mr. Romano and Mr. Cuoco, had numerous meetings with regard to the contemplated construction of the accessory items that I talked about in a minute uh, with both Mr. Wendt and Ms. Harrigan of the zoning department. Indeed, uh, there was a meeting held uh, in addition to numerous other ones on October 21, 2020. At that October meeting, the owner's representatives were advised that the contemplated construction of the expanded pool patio, which is the only thing that's before us here tonight, would have to be consistent with the guidelines, guidelines imposed by the FEMA technical bulletin number five, which you have, which I've made part of the record and I've submitted with my application and I'll talk about more during the course of the presentation. That involves the standards for free of, of obstruction requirements uh, that uh, have to apply. In addition, they were told at that meeting that the cabana uh, could not contain a kitchen area as then proposed, so that was eliminated. At the meeting on October 21st, uh, there were no concerns that were raised with regard to the patio terrace expansion. The pool is there, there's a patio terrace there, and this is just about expanding it as the plan shows. What they were told at the meeting on October 21st was that the patio expansion, uh, terrace expansion, could go forward as long as the FEMA guidelines for construction in the VE zone as set forth in that document, bulletin number five, were complied with. I was not at that meeting, I was not involved at that time, I became involved because after a subsequent meeting on June 23, 2022, the applicant and its representatives were then advised for the first time that the proposal was not in compliance with Section 32.5C of the zoning regulations. The heart of the application to reverse is based upon our belief, as I'll elaborate on, that based upon, one, a review of the Fairfield zoning regulations, specifically Section 32 as a whole, as we'll talk about in a minute. Number two, the intent of the FEMA regulation, which is basically to protect habitable structures. And number three, the content of FEMA bulletin number five as it relates to this particular type of construction. Taking all those things into consideration, it is our position that section 32.5.C should not apply to this patio terrace expansion as it is not a habitable structure and should not be interpreted to prohibit a simple expansion of the already existing patio area. And it's uncontroverted in, in, in that regard that the FEMA bulletin, which I keep referring to, agrees with that. If you look at the FEMA technical bulletin number five, March 2020, it was said, it makes very clear 
that based upon this set of facts, our interpretation of section 32.5C is correct because the staff's interpretation of section 32.5C is not consistent with the provisions and guidance contained in the bulletin. Technical bulletin number five, section R322.34, and if you have it there, it's important that you see it, says, and I quote, requires that slabs used for parking, floors of enclosure, landings, decks, walkways, and patios. It refers specifically to patios and similar uses that are beneath building or located such that they could be undermined or displaced and could cause damage be either one, structurally independent of the foundations and no more than four inches thick, have no turned down edges, have no reinforcing and have isolation joints at pilings and columns and controls or construction joints in both directions, no more than four feet apart. Mr. Romano will review with you in a minute our proposed construction. It's uncontroverted that we comply with that FEMA standard. And it's uncontroverted that that FEMA standard applies directly to patios. So it is our strong belief, and I also attached, and I won't belabor because it's somewhat redundant, material from the American <coughs> Society of Civil Engineers standards, very familiar by Mr. Romano and Mr. Coco, but in that they too adopt the language of the FEMA Bulletin Number 5 as it relates to standards for patio construction in this specific zone. So before I go on, I think it's important that Mr. Romano give you a brief overview of what we very simply propose here. Uh, with reference to and with focus on the fact that it complies in all respects with the standards set forth in FEMA Bulletin Number 5 with regard to the construction of a patio in this particular flood zone. Mr. Romano. Good afternoon. I am uh, Pete Romano. I'm a principal at Land Tech. We are a site civil and environmental firm out of Westport. Uh, there's a fair amount of work in Fairfield as well. I just want to give you a little overview, and you can take a look at the graphics, and you can pretty much figure it out for yourself. This is a site. This is the house that was, you know, within the last five or six years was built. This is the pool area, and this is the patio area. The patio is, I think, 35 by 12, about 420 square feet. Um, and then when I say patio, terrace, whatever, when you see the graphics that uh, Finley's office, Mark Finley's office prepared, you'll see it's, it's essentially a deck that happens to be built out of concrete. There's, I'm going to put it up for you just a minute. I don't know if you've got copies of it. But. <clears throat> the existing patio that's attached to the uh, pool is at elevation 11, and the VE zone, which, uh, which is a high velocity zone, usually sub subjected to wave action and stuff, is at elevation 14. Um, you could build it at 14, and you could, and it would, would work at 14. Uh, we're trying to match what's there. And I, this is this is an example of what it is. It's essentially on piers, and the deck sits, the concrete deck sits on top of it at elevation 11.5. There's no fill associated with it. So it's picture a deck. But, you know, picture a fixed pier at your dock, right? It's a timber flat area supported by piles and cross members, and that's what this is, except it's built out of, out of concrete. And the, the flat surface that you walk on is at elevation 11.5, three and a half feet, you know, below the VE zone. But you can build in the VE zone. Uh, you can build in the VE zone as long as you meet the building code and you meet the FEMA's regulations. And this does meet that. Um, I take the position also that it's not habitable space. Um, if you look at the FEMA's uh, definition of habitable space, it needs a certain amount of walls around it to constitute the inhabitable space. We've removed all the kitchen appliances and cabinets and stuff from inside the cabana, but that's not what's in front of us tonight. We we want relief from the decision that um, didn't allow this deck patio terrace to be constructed. It'll be a continuation of the existing patio at elevation 11.5. There'll be no fill placed underneath it. 
And why we're here basically is because we have a horizontal structure that is below the 100 year flood elevation and the regs say you need to be one foot above that. So that would put this patio someplace around 15, elevation 15 or 16. But I, I think I mentioned before, DEP allows it, the FEMA allows it. Um, mm -hmm. It just happens to be that this particular uh, section in Fairfield's regs uh, is interpreted in such that they, they don't allow this. Uh, Thank, all right. you. Thank you. <coughs> so just to, to, to finish up on the aspect of the matter that retain, pertains to the reversal of uh, the officer's decision, as I said before, it's our position and our interpretation of Section 32.5C that the proposal complies with and our interpretation of Section 32.5C complies with the FEMA bulletin and standards as set forth, the FEMA guidelines and standards as set forth in bulletin number five, the American Society of Civil Engineers standards, which we've also made part of the record, and also the provisions that you'll find in Section 32.3F and 32.4 of the regulations, which provide that there be consideration, there will not be any increase in coastal flood levels. So all of those things, and looking at the regulations as a whole, uh, would lead us to conclude, and we respectfully ask you to consider and conclude, that in fact, the uh, interpretation of 32.5C as given by the staff is not correct because it's not consistent with the FEMA guidelines and those other standards I reference. Turning my attention to the second application. Attorney Fallon, I think it might make sense and ease for this board that we have questions on the reversal before you go into Fine. that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the fact it's a continuous, but I think it might be just a little easier for us to sure. grasp. Does the board have any questions relative to the first aspect, which is reversal? Uh, you might have some questions, uh, Mr. Wendt, uh, gave us a memo, which we've all had uh, available for uh, his comments. Uh, and I think Attorney Fallon has, has addressed that uh, to some extent. He may address it later after some questions, or I may finalize it and sum it up at the end. But do we have any questions on this aspect? Yes, Jane. Um, you are saying that this is at 1135, right? I'm saying, yes, the, the, the Yes, the, the impact of the uh, interpretation of the regulations applied by staff would require our proposal uh, to have the bottom of the lowest horizontal structural member at ele elevation 15.1. That would be 14 feet plus one foot one inches. And what we're proposing, for the, as Mr. Romano references uh, in his presentation, is that that elevation be at 10.78. That's that's the variance request, which we'll get to in a minute. So, in other words, the undersize of that slab is what you're the 10.78. Correct. Because that has to be right. correct. If you accept Mr. Wentz's interpretation, then that underside has to be at 15.1, 14 feet plus 1.1 feet. If you interpret 32.5C in the manner that he does. Well, 32.5A is very specific about it being the bottom. Correct. Just so we know. Yes. Not yes. The Correct. Okay. The lowest horizontal structural right. member right. is what it says. And why are you not back to 100 meters? Mr. Romano? <clears throat> you, you, we tried to keep, I'm Pete Romano with Lantech. We try to keep it just free flowing underneath there. There, they, <clears throat> There is some limit on how much fill you can put in the VE zone. Mm -hmm. And so we're just keeping it open. It doesn't diminish any of the capacity. The wave action and stuff will have no well, effect. It'll be, it'll be a pier. The way I would describe it is think about a pile that's holding up a, a dock. Right. Right? It's, it's designed to take the forces. I mean, you can build in a V, uh, you can build houses right. in a V zone. So where, where are the columns? This is right here. So the rest of it is yeah. I mean, what's Right. The this is, it's another column on the other side. This cross section doesn't, doesn't show it. Is it a freestanding space or does it open? Right no. Anyway? No. It's, it's above. Yeah. Think about all walking off a wood. Yeah, yeah. Think about walking off a wood deck off the back of your house, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Step down or whatever. It's up in the air, open underneath. Yep. Yeah. 
questions? Any other questions on uh, the reversal? Okay. Um, we'll, we'll take other comments yeah. together as it's opposed. But sure. Uh, I thought that was helpful to at least have, have that in our head. Uh, right. Now you can move on to the variant. The request and the alternative. So, Mr. Went and I have had a professional marriage for 35 years, and we seldom disagree. I probably disagree a lot more with my wife than I do with Mr. Went over that time. So, turning to the variance request, uh, I think there's equally good grounds for consideration of resolving this matter uh, on the variance level, and I will explain that for these reasons. As I said, the variance, the specific variance, as the call indicates, is to allow a uh, horizontal structural member uh, for this expanded patio being established at elevation 10.78 rather than 15.1. First of all, I would start with section 32.7 of your regulations. You do have authority to grant the variance here, not only pursuant to Connecticut General Statutes 8-6, but specifically under your own regulations uh, under Section 32.7, because Section 32.7 of the regulations explicitly provides authority for this board to grant variances of the provisions of Section 32 of the zoning regulations um, subject to certain considerations. A variance is appropriate here pursuant to said section in that if you look at section 32.7, uh, we're, we are not, we are complying uh, with all of the factors, most importantly being there be no increase in flood levels during the base flood discharge resulting from the proposed construction of this patio and terrace. That's the, that's the most fundamental standard under 32.7 for granting a variance of, of section 32 as we ask you to do here, 32.5C. And again, there's no question that we're not gonna increase any flood levels during the base flood discharge resulting from the proposed construction expansion of this patio. So from the start, we have authority under the regulations for you to grant this variance, and we meet the standards that 32.7 imposes. Mr. Wentz's memo of August 29th addresses his position and in terms of the interpretation of section 32.5C, and I think we've discussed that. I think that's for the board to ultimately make a decision on. You understand his position, I've articulated mine. But having said that, independently of that, we can look at whether it would be appropriate to grant a variance for this very benign request to expand an existing patio next to an existing pool. There again, we turn to section 8-6, because 8-6 still applies here. 32.7 gives you the right to grant a variance, but you still have to apply the same standards as found in section 8-6 of the statute. And as this board well knows, there's two factors. One, you have to find that what is uh, being proposed is not going to substantially affect the comprehensive zoning plan and have harm, if you will. And the second is that there is some factor here in these facts that establish legal hardship. Let's talk about the first one first. Clearly, if the use to be allowed of, under a variance constitutes a permitted use under the zoning regulations, then the Egan case, which I quote to you all the time, stands for the proposition that the first part of the test is met. Well, clearly, the expansion of this existing patio terrace area is an appropriate accessory use to the single family residence which exists on the property. More importantly, or as importantly, in this particular instance, are factors that I already referenced but will reference again. The granting of the variance will not in any way increase flood levels during the base flood discharge. Therefore, it's compliant with your standards in section 32.7. Furthermore, the patio terrace expansion as proposed has been designed to meet all applicable VE construction standards as set forth specifically in your regulations. In addition, it's compliant with the provisions of section 32.3F and 32.4 of your regulation in that there will be no increase 
and coastal flood levels resulting from the construction of the expanded terrace or patio. The plans as submitted also meet all the requirements of your regulations set forth in Section 321C of the regulations. And furthermore, the construction as proposed of the expanded patio terrace is consistent with the provisions and, and the requirements uh, contained in FEMA Bulletin Number 5, which I previously referred to you and which again is referred to in my material for the variance application. And again, I'd only emphasize explicitly references patios and the standards for constructions of patios in this zone. And we comply with those standards, <clears throat> as is the case with the American Society of Civil Engineers. So I think all of those factors <coughs> establish compliance with the first part of the statutory test, which is you know, consistent with the comprehensive zoning plan. We're consistent with every single aspect of your regulation, except the difference in interpretation that Mr. Went and I have with regard to 325C. And leaving that aside, the question then becomes, okay, but in this case, as it relates to this modest, benign expansion of an existing patio, is there a proper basis to grant a variance, even if you accept Mr. Vent, Mr. Went's interpretation? And I submit to you that there is. Certainly the first part of the test, I think, has a plethora of satisfying elements. With regard to the hardship requirement, the controlling legal fact here is that this property was not subject to the current designation within the high velocity flood zone, VE14, at the time that the property was purchased, at the time that the overall construction plan was approved by the town, including these accessory elements, and at the time that substantially large portions of the property, the house and the pool, were actually constructed. At the time that the, the approval of the construction of the dwelling and the accessory improvements to the property, provision was made to expand the for the existing pool and for, that was made for the expansion here. Then came this change. The element of the proposed improvements was in fact what we're asking was originally part of the town's approval. So when they changed the FEMA mapping, as they did, I believe very arbitrarily, in July of 2013, well after my client bought the property and commenced the construction, it seems to me that that obviously does establish a factual circumstances that creates a hardship situation because the law is replete with examples where impacts of subsequent changes in zone, changes in zoning regulations uh, can constitute hardship for purposes of granting a variance. And in this particular case, the overall change in the mapping, mid-construction, when there was a set of approvals in place, seems to me to satisfy the hardship requirement. So our position is, on the variance side, that the proposed expansion of the pool terrace is, as previously approved by the town prior to the FEMA mapping, complies with all those provisions of the regulations I've redundantly mentioned, 32.7a, 32.3f, 32.4. In addition, the construction is compliant. This whole thing is about FEMA. And the irony here is we're fighting about the interpretation of 32.5c. In this application, we're asking you to grant a variance of it. But there's no argument that what the FEMA bulletin number five says and what it says about patios and what the standards are, and we comply with that. So we believe that the granting of the variance that we ask you for is not at all inconsistent with the, the letter or the intent of the FEMA regulations as it relates to this patio expansion. And therefore, we think that that satisfies a basis for granting the variance, especially when you have underlying hardship here which is occasioned by the fact that this whole situation is created when FEMA comes in and goes whoop with some sort of a map program and, and, and subsumes this property in another, in another flood zone. So those are the two applications. Um, all we want to do is this modest expansion of the patio terrace with all the bells and whistles. And what you need to ask yourself is, 
does it comply with the appropriate standards for construction as set forth in the FEMA regulations and by the American Society of Engineers? And the answer is it does. Does it comply, save for the interpretation of 32.5C, with all the standards otherwise promulgated in Section 32 of your regulations? It does. So at the end of the day, whether it's determined that the staff decision should be reversed or whether the staff decision should not be disturbed and a variance granted, I think the record is strong in both aspects. And all we want to do is finish this patio, which has been ongoing for now 10 years. So it seems to me that you, you've got everything I can offer you with regard to this. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance, and I know in your diligence you probably have, because that's the way you approach things, but to look at those materials we submitted, uh, including the FEMA, to me, that's, to me that's overwhelming. And I recognize that staff would take the position that, well, we can impose a higher standard uh, than, than FEMA. I guess my answer here in this particular case to be to be to what end? I know in this town we're very sensitive about FEMA issues because of other unrelated matters that have occurred, but this property owner and this terrorist shouldn't be held hostage to that, especially when you have uncontroverted evidence that this thing is designed exactly as FEMA says it has to be in this flood zone for this type of structure. So I hope you'll consider both applications, as I know you will. We have oh, Mr. Romano, why don't you say something? One more. I just wanted to be, oh, Pete Romano again from Land Tech. What John alluded to uh, about the FEMA line being changed, and the process that FEMA isn't whoosh, it's actually, uh, they actually come out and study it. So just, just take a look at this. When we were the original engineers on the project, when they built the house, built the pool, there was a beautiful house over here, the side over here, and big wall along here, nice walkway and stuff. The VE zone was down here someplace, right? And now the VE zone is all around here. We're completely in it. And why that is? The people on both sides before 2013 had filled their property and elevated them. And so that shoved the VE zone basically up this channel up 1125 Pequot Avenue. And so now, you know, even the house is theoretically out of compliance. I think it's actually at 11, it's actually at 15 right now. Um, but the, the balance of the, the site here is, all, and it should be at 16 the house, and the balance of it is all underneath the, the elevation. But that's how it occurred. So in 2013, actually twice in 2013, they changed the FEMA lines in January, and then they did them again in July, which, they probably haven't changed the FEMA lines in 40 years before that. But so they come in and they assess the topography on all the property. If a private homeowner was doing this and they wanted to change the line, it's called the LOMA, uh, Line of Map Amendment. And so you go in there and prove to them what the elevations are and that's how you get yourself out of the flood zone. In this instance, we just were, you know, bystanders at the time. They came in and redid the line and it, if you look on the bigger maps, you'll see right up 1125, that's where the VE zone. Yeah, so it put us in non-compliance, basically, when they changed the maps. In 2000. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I don't know. Oh, we have some uh, questions on the variance. Mm -hmm. James, can I ask? Well, can I just go back to the other um, drawing, please? Mm -hmm. You're, you keep referring to this as a patio? Patio terrace, yes. Right, right. But do we have yeah. a definition of patio? Because yeah. I think of a patio is something that's not great. But if this was built out of wood, I have it. it would be in debt, no? Mm -hmm. so I don't. What is the same regulation? How is it going? Are you saying it's like a patio? Well, I don't. I mean, again, the whole underlying thing here is you're in the flood zone, so it's the FEMA regulation. Right. The, the FEMA regulation that bulletin number five refers to slabs used for blah 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 patios. Uh, so that's that's basically what we have. I don't believe we have a definition in the regulation. But um, that's essentially what this is. If you go out to the site now, the pat there's a patio slash terrace. Choose your. Right, your sitting on grade. Yeah, yeah, it's there. Right. And this is just extending it. 
but extending it now in such a way that it would be compliant with those design requirements that are set forth in that FEMA bulletin number five. I have questions relative to the variance. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the thickness of this uh, slab? It's a concrete deck to me. Uh, yeah, so Mr. Romano, <laughs> what is, so what's the, so what is the, uh, what is the th thickness? I know it's 1.6, 1 foot 6 inches at the end where you have a little uh, raise, but what is the, the, the main full body? Maybe Mr. Pope can answer that. Yeah, can you come up to the, if you could answer that just so they can pick you up on the microphone, identify yourself. Hi, I'm Nick Cuoco, Cuoco Structural Engineers. Uh, the deck is approximately eight inches thick of concrete. Uh, we've got a, uh, a curb around the end to basically allow the uh, partition and railing and so forth to be attached to. That's going to be required so that you um, uh, don't fall off the deck. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of a Weird way of saying it, but uh, that is what it is. I have, and maybe Mr. Popo, maybe Mr. Romano, um, concerning FEMA, and, and I understand personally why FEMA has those regulations, and LOMA, uh, I chose not to do it, luckily, because I had flood insurance, because I didn't do that. Uh, so uh, they don't want the structure to divert the water and channel the water, is one aspect. They don't want structures floating and damaging other property. Mm -hmm. uh, so what about this design helps us to comply with 32.7 that this isn't increasing mm -hmm. any floodwaters? Okay. Uh, in the FEMA bulletin number five, the first part, as uh, Attorney Fallon mentioned, is uh, you need a four-inch slab maximum, so forth, unreinforced, blah, blah, blah. The second part of that, which uh, the zoning regulations arbitrarily, or in my opinion, inadvertently, I would like to say, uh, deleted, is the aspect that allows any structure that, to, that is within a flood zone to be designed to accept and resist those design, those forces associated with that flood event. So this. This slab is being designed to resist the uplift forces that are caused by the, uh, uh, should there be a flood elevation or a flood event trying to lift the slab off, off the ground um, or off its foundations. Uh, it's being founda founded in the ground. It really doesn't show up very well, but I know you have copies of these. You'll see here uh, there's roughly two foot by two foot concrete columns in three distinct locations. Uh, that are supported on a concrete uh, pile cap with piers or, or piles that are anchored down to resist the uplift forces. So uh, this is not going to be able to, in addition to the eight inch thick concrete slab, it's not going to just be able to lift up and float away. It's not going anywhere. Uh, on the other end, it's being connected to the existing uh, concrete retaining wall, which was built during the initial uh, project. Uh, that's not moving and going anywhere at this point. Uh, so for this section of deck to float away, um, you would really need uh, a substantial amount of force there, which um, is unforeseen. Not to get into the weeds, but I'm guessing you're tying in with quarter half entry bar down to the piles. And yeah, yeah, it's all being designed to to meet all of the flood regulations and the flood forces. Uh, the, the major issue here is going to be having the, the flood or the wave action striking the end of these things, which um, it will be designed to carry that, that force. I mean, there's no difference in designing this as if you were designing, you know, as Attorney Fallon and, and uh, uh, Mr. Romano mentioned, going into a, uh, a dock. Uh, you've got docks that are down below the flood line. Uh, the, the flood line or the docks themselves are designed to take the horizontal impact of the wave action. Uh, this is um, designed no differently. Uh, the only benefit we have here is that this is actually um, <coughs> if you were to look from here from the um, 
from the uh, Long Island Sound to where we are, we are probably somewhere in the 60 to 80 foot range away. So um, it's a lot less, even though the, theoretically the forces would be the same, the probability of having that same kind of a force that you're going to have uh, with the dock <coughs> extending over Long Island Sound uh, being the same as what you're gonna have 80 feet away is, um, is very small even though we will, it is being designed to resist that. Okay. Any other questions? No, okay. Um, six months before that arbitrary change in FEMA regulations, we had standing. Do you have historical documentation on where the water came? I do not, know. Essentially, that, that elevation change was from Sandy. So how much water would have covered this patio? Well, in Sandy, strangely enough, it wasn't a 100-year flood. It was the wave action and the wind forces that created it. So if you look, we took a 100-year storm, right? And it's, we're, we agree now that it's 14 in this area. You'd have three and a half feet of water over the site, around somewhere around 11. But the idea there is, again, the FEMA regulations, the FEMA Bulletin 5, you know, is, is cognizant of that. And so what they do is they set standards of design relative to structures such as this, the slabs used as patios, and we're complying with them. So that even in that circumstance, and as Mr. Cuoco just said, this thing is built in such a way that it in all likelihood will withstand that. So I'm not concerned about the concrete itself. I'm concerned about what's holding up the concrete. Okay. And being I'm not an architect nor an engineer, I need to know how this is retained because <clears throat> I don't live on the sound. I live on a lake that doesn't have waves. And when it flooded about five years ago, it lifted the dock right off the cement pilings because it floated. Mm -hmm and didn't land back in the same spot. No. So can you address that in sure. terms of how it, how it is anchored in such a sure. way to resist those types of forces? Uh, let's go back to the uh, uh, drawings here. Um, I believe you have copies of these if you look on your SC2. Um, it's kind of basically the cross section through here. Um, I could reference it, I can show it, but if you're looking at it, you can actually see it a lot better there. Um, you'll notice that along section B, the one on the bottom, um, we show a note here. These shows where all the flood elevations are and so forth. But we also show, it says bottom of slab elevation. And then we show where the existing ground is. Uh, just right there, there's a note that says the line of two foot by two foot uh, concrete column beyond. Uh, the way this is being designed is the slab spans to these concrete columns, which I said there are three of them. Uh, those concrete columns are cast uh, and doweled into this reinforced concrete footing, for lack of a better term. Um, that footing has uh, four uh, helical piles. I'm not sure who knows what helical piles are, who doesn't know what helical piles are. A, a quick synopsis, a quick story of what helical piles are is basically, some people refer to them as screw piles. Um, they get basically augered into the ground. Um, they get drilled in and basically they look like a corkscrew. They come in incremental sections. They get bolted together as they go down, the, down into, the, into the ground and they're bolted in sections. Um, and they're designed to resist not only a downward force but also an upward force. Uh, the depth that those piles go is a function of two things. One is the soil pressures and the soil capacities of resisting or bearing on the helix. The helix are that the corkscrew areas. Uh, the other aspect of it is the condition and the type of soils that are present in those locations. 
uh, as I mentioned, these are screwed in and you know basically drilled into the ground with the machine uh, that basically represents uh, a handheld ratchet set. You know, you just keep turning it and it just goes down into the ground. Uh, there's correlations and there's test data and helical piles have been around for at least 30 to 40 years. Uh, they've really become in their own now and everybody with raising their homes up along the, uh, the, uh, the sound, uh, they've really become primarily what's being used to do that. Uh, but they've been around for 30, 40 years at least. And uh, there's correlation between the torque used in driving these into the ground and developing what the resistance is for the uplift or tension on the resistance of those piles. Uh, so what we will do is we determine what the force is or potential uplift force um, based on, you know, the uh, bottom of this being at whatever elevation it is versus whatever elevation the flood regulations require it to be, calculating the uplift pressure associated with that, and then determining what kind of a, a hold down system that we need. Um, and the depth of, and that's where we determine the depth of the piles. So that's how this whole thing is designed so it's not going to float away or move. Uh, everything is tied together, drilled, anchored, cast in place concrete tied together uh, so that it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, create any um, lifting up off of the piles and moving away type of thing. This, there's no way this is going to lift up the piles and, and move away. <coughs> Question, I have a question. So, um, FEMA publication number five, mm -hmm. you're saying that you're totally compliant with it? Correct. Yes. Okay, so then I'm looking at section on concrete slabs, mm -hmm. and it says that the requirement that um, slabs used for decorative habits, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, um, that are in these buildings or located, mm -hmm. uh, the Structurally independent, mm -hmm. no more than four inches thick. Right, but they also have you a caveat as number two. The the first part of that is what's basically a, copied in the in the Fairfield zoning regulations. Okay. What Fairfield zoning regulations did, and this was basically discussed with uh, our meeting with uh, Ms. Harrigan, okay. is that basically um, <clears throat> the second part of the FEMA regulation that allowed. Um, the slabs to be designed to resist the forces associated with it was stricken from the, FEMA, the zoning regulations. So you're saying this number two? Number two is what we are. Okay, was self supporting and remain intact. Okay. Correct. And that's what we're going with. We're self supporting mm -hmm. and we will remain intact uh, in, that, uh, in that area. Any, any other questions? I just have a procedural question. If we overturn the staff refusal. Is the variance required at that point, or are we still okay? Uh, I'll be getting to you in one second because I think uh, you might be opposition. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, any other questions? There was an All right. Anyone wish to speak in favor of the application? Anyone in opposition, Mr. Wen? I think because you had a comment. There's the reversal, and then there's the variance. So you can you can address whichever one Thank you. Uh, or both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jim Wen, Planning Director. Um, I, I'm, I'm here in case you had any questions about the memo. I think it speaks for itself. I, I don't want to belabor it. Um, suffice it to say. I respectfully disagree with my uh, apparent professional spouse <laughs> that um, it, the issue here is because the grade drops off from where the current patio is. If this were a slab on existing grade, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Because of the need to equalize that elevation, it's essentially a cantilevered deck as, as you have described it, and therefore we believe that creates uh, an impermissible horizontal obstruction. Having said all that, I, I want to make clear for this record that we're not objecting or taking a position on the variance uh, application. We do certainly um, disagree with the position on the reverse and modified piece of this application, but I'm not here to take a position one way or the other to advocate for or oppose uh, the variance application. I do agree 
with what's been said that this particular property is somewhat uniquely impacted by the revision to that map. And I also agree that this current design with the open concept it is a lesser uh, of an obstruction than a previous version of the plan that called for fill and, and a retaining wall. So I just want to make clear that we're not here objecting to or necessarily advocating for the variance, um, but uh, I do respectfully disagree with the, the position taken by uh, the applicant with respect to the interpretation of the regulation. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Actually, I have one really quick for my own lexicon. Is what's proposed here technically a cantilevered system because of the piles front and rear, or is it because it has the front pile, it's not a cantilevered system? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a technical enough expert to be able to, to say. I don't think it's technically cantilevered because it has that other column. Uh, I do have great confidence in uh, Mr. Cuoco's ability to design a structure that's, that will sustain the, the, the forces that may be placed upon it. Um, but if, if this natural grade continued across and they wanted to expand their patio, we wouldn't be here. It's just right. by the fact that it either requires uh, uh, an impermissible amount of fill or creates that obstruction is what the technical issue is here. Um, so I don't know if that uh, address, I don't know that it's technically a cantilever since it's supported by columns at, at the end, but, but the way this is designed, I think it represents a, a minimal uh, obstruction. I think my father. Commissioner's concern would be more valid if it were a cantilevered system because all of the weight being at the extreme end and having the less possibility of concrete. But with the front pile, I'm just I'm, I'm a little more set at ease. Any other questions for Mr. Wen? Uh, just let me see if there's anyone else in opposition. Is there anyone else who wants to speak in opposition? Okay. Uh, Mr. Allen, you can comment on, on that. It was a hybrid of opposition and not opposition. No, I, 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 I know, Commissioner, had a, you had a question because we can get. I just, I'm just zeroing in on um, section here in five. Mm -hmm. If we're going to look at um, number two. Mm -hmm. It says that the slab has to be self-supporting, mm -hmm. but it's tied into an existing foundation. Well, how is it self-supporting? Nick, do you want to address that? The slab itself. Oh, you come up here. Oh, the slab, the self-supporting means it it must it, it uses itself to be supported or be supported by its own means. So we are using the existing wall to support one end of it. So how is it self-supporting? We're just talking about that portion that. Well, this whole area here is the, is, the, is the deck. I mean, we could theoretically just as easily put another set of concrete columns right alongside there. Does it meet that definition? I, in my opinion, it does, yes, without it. Doesn't it, it, doesn't, it also say, doesn't it define self-supporting as being independent of foundation, not specifically any pre-existing? I thought it said of or independent of foundation for dwelling. Mr. Romano, I have an interpretation of that. Okay, no, yes, and Mr. Romano, too. So it seems there's a lot of knowledge in the room. Again, Jim, when I don't know that that's directly applicable because it's really talking about slabs that are on grade. Yeah. So this really, I, I don't think, necessarily applies there. Um, it is a structure that's above grade and is supported and is going to be certified to be able to withstand flood forces, which is a key component to all of this. So I don't know that that section is a, a direct match to what's being proposed yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it's particularly germane to the, to the question at hand, in, in my opinion. All right. Any other questions? Any other follow-up? Or are you all set? Well, I, I just want to thank Mr. Wendt for his comments I, I, and the candor of the comments. You know, we, we can agree to disagree on 325C, but I think I would end where I was, and that's with, okay, then let's talk about the statutory basis and the regulatory basis for a variance of 325C so that this property owner can finish this project. And I think you're well served by your record here, including Mr. Wendt's comments, 
Uh, you have 32.7, which authorizes you to grant variances, provide certain conditions are met. In this case, those conditions are satisfied. There's not going to be any increase in flood potential. And then you have your old friends and Connecticut General Statutes 8 6. And I think we have established that there's nothing here that's going to be uh, cause harm or be inconsistent with the comprehensive zoning plan. And I think there is direct and fairly unique hardship relative to the impact of this property on the change of the FEMA regulations, which interestingly enough, Mr. Romano points out, was occasioned by actions of the adjacent neighbors over the course of time. Not that they did it with any ill will, but it, it further gets to the uniqueness of the situation. So <clears throat> I don't have much more to add. Um, I think there's a strong basis here uh, in the record to, on the application, but most especially, uh, and in light of Mr. Wen's comments, I'd ask you to consider the variance application uh, because I think this has got to be one of the most significantly designed structures. And Mr. Coco, I should say about embarrassing, and his reputation is well known in this community and others as nerds of his abilities as a structural engineer. So that the, the, the integrity of this structure and the fact that it's not going to have any adverse impacts even in the most um, flood-prone situations, I think, is beyond reproach. So hopefully you'll consider both these applications carefully and act as you always do judiciously and your eyes on the statutes and the law. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Attorney Fallon. We're going to close the hearing on 1125. We go into uh, the session. All right. Um, Socialists are off. Social events for the soccer program are going to be uh, delayed. <laughs> uh, so continue docket. Uh, number 14, 277, Paymore Drive. Uh, Rizio presented this for Mrs. Zaharis. Uh, permission to construct one story, one car uh, garage addition. Entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Right. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jane. Discussion? I'm going to get mine out of the way early. <laughs> it's, it's a reasonable request. I think they did their diligence in terms of getting it to the right positioning and keeping it within the, uh, within the view of the neighborhood. It is better to move back. Yeah. Go up front. yeah. And have it attached with the proposed exit. Right. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> we fixed the glitch. Any other discussion? Number one on the general docket, 165 uh, Lounge Road, Mr. Olson he presented his application to construct uh, a shed on the side of his property. Entertain a motion to approve. So moved. I answer a second. Second. Thank you, Terry. Discussion? No one's objecting to join the neighborhood checking No one. His is the only house on that little street, yeah. and then you got the, the church. Yeah. It's just it's just an easier access way for people to for the church traffic. So the only mm -hmm. time you have traffic is when they're picking up for first light uh, for the summer program or dropping yeah. off or when they're going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looks like General Patton. Uh, Looks like General Patton. Bring it to a vote. I was going with Carl Cozo. Yes. 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 Uh, number two, uh, 43, uh, Warwick, uh, uh, Mr. Balbacini, uh, presented his application, uh, and it's to construct second floor addition. Uh, entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Brian, is there a second? Second. Okay. All right. Discussion? <coughs> I, get to use, I get to use my other favorite word now, which is a minimus request. We're going vertical. It's not a <coughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Salud. Excuse me. All right. No other discussion. Okay. Okay. Yes. 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 <coughs> yes. Yes. Number three, sixty Puritan Road. Attorney Fallon presented this uh, to construct a uh, covered open patio. Uh, entertain a motion to approve so with the condition oh, that there be no walls. With that condition, entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All right. Thank you. Discussion? I don't think that the hardship is legitimate. I mean, I'm sorry for the family's medical woes, but it doesn't really apply to this property. I'm saying it's too sunny. There's 
not really a legitimate hardship in my view. There are other, there are other ways to stay out of the sun. I don't think it's outside the keeping of the neighborhood. I don't think it's going to present any, any I don't think it's an eyesore. I don't think it's a problem. I think we have the, the flexibility to grant something, whether it's a, a, whether, yeah, I think we have, I think we have that for you. I agree. We can be flexible. Yes. All right. Bring it to a vote. Okay. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Number seven, uh, four, uh, number four, 70 Sanford Street, uh, petition to the town of uh, Fairfield. Tony Fitzpatrick presented this uh, to allow seasonal outdoor events uh, with the condition for these outdoor events to be, I'll entertain the motion to approve the condition of the outdoor events will be after 5 p.m. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All right, discussion. I was going to present. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. This is really no different than doing concerts at the Green. I mean, it's outdoor music and Correct. people Good drive point. and find those parts. Yeah, right. Yep. And they've been having the outdoor event yeah. Yeah. Right. for a long time, right. for a while now. Yeah. And we haven't had issues and complaints. And uh, I think a lot of people look up to speak highly of those events uh, and enjoy them. So. Yeah, my, my only. Initial concern, the question that I have up front is the potential for co scheduling indoor and outdoor events, which would possibly bring a bigger crowd and what have you, but it's not enough of a concern for me to. It'll be a bigger crowd, but I think that's going to be self regulating. Yeah. If there's mm -hmm. going to be certain music outside and I want to have some folk music inside, I'm not. No, going, absolutely. I'm not going inside. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, all right. Faith? Yes. 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 Number five, 1143 South Hill Road, lot three. I'm going to raise your this is similar to the other one, but we need to take them separately. Um, and this is to reduce the lot frontage on the uh, lot three. Entertain a motion to approve. So move. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you, Terry. Discussion? Some minor, some minor change. Right. The fact is going to keep the building. You want to say that? Yeah, and then yeah. Well, who would, oh, yeah. the right line would turn it down. No, right. Exactly. <laughs> no respect for the history. No, beautiful. Yeah. I remember the garage uh, variant. Beautiful piece. Yes. So. Faith? Yes. 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 Number six, 1143 Saskatoon Road, Spot 1. Turn to raise your of this as well. And that's to reduce. Uh, the lot size of uh, that particular lot uh, from 87,120 square feet to 81,764 square feet. Uh, uh, entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Thank you, Brian. Second? Second. Thank you, Jane. Uh, discussion. Still going too far. You wouldn't know if it was 2 or 1.8. It's invisible. Maybe they can also pretend that beautiful courtyard is theirs. Is theirs, sure, absolutely. Faith? Yes. 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 Number seven, 1125 Pequot Avenue, Trent Fallon presented this trading. Uh, this is to reverse the decision of the zoning administrator uh, uh, and uh, as to denying uh, their permit to put this uh, patio deck uh, on there. Uh, so entertain a motion uh, to approve this request. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. The discussion. And first thing, because I don't want anyone confused, um, your vote on this, a yes, means reverse the zoning department's decision. Just so we're clear. A yes to this motion is reversing the zoning department's uh, position. Okay, so let's discuss the first. Well, this is what is, you know, this argument in the paper that that section is not is not applicable to the habitable structures, it's applicable to all structures. So I don't think there's any denying that. Yeah, right. And it's the DE, uh, so the 
yeah. through the comparing it to the 32, um, 32.3 is not applicable. Um, so, that there's, so there's a distinction. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. All right. So bring it to a vote. Yes, yes means reverse. What's your vote? So yes is is I'm voting for the engineers and not for the staff. To reverse the interpretation of the zoning regulations. Am I allowed not to vote? <laughs> you gotta vote. <laughs> <clears throat> yes is reverse. No is not reverse. So no is in support of the staff. Correct. Yes is in support of attorney Powell. So since I cannot not vote, I'm voting no. Okay. Yes. Come on, no. 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 Uh, that has been denied. Number eight is 1125 Pequot Avenue, ready trading for variance. Of the zoning break in 32.7 to allow uh, the the patio deck pretty uh, to benefit this entertain a motion to approve so there a second second discussion on this I think they've satisfied 32.7 in particular a and the structural integrity of this so yeah, um, I think more than also a variance they have a unique property by our zoning department's own statement. Right, and there's actually something we didn't even talk about because if you do this, then you have to acknowledge that no insurance, no insurance is going to cover you if something happens. Yeah. Right? Insurance isn't going to cover this anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to cover the cabana. It's not going to cover anything else out yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. FEMA is pretty generous to some people. Trust me. FEMA does not cover yeah. uh, trust, trust me. I had trust. three Rockaway houses go down. Trust and, the uh, one who got the knife. <laughs> some some so, people made out well. The, oh, the only fine, thing. But I got the knife on the outside. Out of structures. <laughs> my dad, my everything. The only thing that I want to just verify for my own edification here is that Nothing's going on top of this thing. This is just this is just the approval for this for the deck for the decking. I think they might have a couple chairs. Thank you for the literalism being what it is. I'm referring to any structure or tied to head. So just we're just dealing with the slab. Yeah, that's they built it well. They're going to build it well. Yes. Mr. Cuoco has been an expert witness to structural engineer in many cases. Yeah. All right, uh, bring it to a vote. Yes means the variance is granted. <laughs> yes means they can build it. I don't know, it. Guy, it <laughs> I, you're going to need to clarify what the difference between seven and eight is better, because I do not feel capable of voting on something that has to do with safety and I, I well, so, so basically, he wants a variance to build this, and how is this different than seven? Seven is to reverse the zoning department's decision that they couldn't just get a permit without getting a variance of the regulations because the zoning department's interpretation of 32.5. What they presented in the variance is that they comply with the safety, they comply with 32.7, not to increase flooding not to allow the structure to flow away, which is that's what FEMA is, is all about, and that they comply with the FEMA technical specification. So it's an interpretation on one end of our zoning officials saying, we just can't give you a building permit. You need to come to this board to get a variance, just like they do, just like they did on every single other one that came before us, before this. They said, we can't issue you, based upon our interpretation, reading strictly what we read. Now they come to us to vary it, to say we can vary it, and we can vary it under 32.7 by these assurances, and that's specifically why I asked the question that I did of Mr. Cuoco, and why I like the presentation of Mr. Romano, is that those assurances, in my opinion, they have made, they're putting it back on them 
be frank, what this does is it, it allows them to get a variance and puts the responsibility on the owner. They that, can't come that, to the town and say, question. you let us build this. Well, that is my question. So now that it's off the town's plate, do I grant, if I grant them, do I take on that responsibility, that no, liability no, 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 in no. any way? No. 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 We're, we're, we've granted it for a reason and they're on notice of it. You're not, I don't, no, you're not. Gonna. If it washes away, they don't come back to us. You're not liable. And who's standing behind that? Tell the fan You just stated it. I don't I couldn't see. Anyone can sue anyone. They, and if someone takes that case, <laughs> good luck to them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they're, they're not, they're, well, I won't, I won't comment further. I'm not. I'm not, okay. not I'm just a chairman. I'm not the attorney. My, my <laughs> initial vote is passed, and I will determine how okay. I go with the end. All right. Yes. 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 You can well, vote. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.